Well, in light of what we are now hearing that's going on in Ukraine, between Russia and Ukraine, um, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce someone who knows an awful lot about that nation, a good friend, Rich Carell. Rich, welcome to our little podcast here. Thank you, Randy. Good to be with you. Let me tell you a little bit more about Rich. He is a former steel marketing executive turned church planting missionary. Now there's a contrast and a move to the former Soviet Union, specifically the Ukraine area for the most part. And since 1991, the mission he's been involved with has over 2000 church plants with over 14,000 folks being baptized and 91 drug rehab homes being formed. And there's a handful of reasons why, you know, he's kind of an unlikely person to go to the Ukraine to do that. Uh, by his own admission, he launched a ministry called Church Planters Training International in 1992 as its founder and president. He had no prior theological or church planting experience. He definitely was a Christ follower, however. Uh, in his earlier years, as indicated, he worked for Bethlehem Steel as a sales manager. Um, and he... He didn't, uh, you know, speak the East Slavic native language, Ukrainian, uh, nor did he dialogue in Russian language, um, and he didn't know any of the 40 minority languages there, <laughs> and I like what you had to say about that, Rich. You said, my joke is we did everything wrong. That's right, yes. But it worked out pretty good. That's because of God, wasn't it? And That's uh, exactly right. You know, and you, I mean, if you, you just, if you, you, do, if you do things. Yeah. God's way and God's time. He works it out. There you go. He just, he just takes us along for the ride. Yep. That's so good. It, it, to continue just a little bit, you possess the gift of exhortation and you have a heartbeat for apostolic vision and a ton of courage, I would say, and just a willingness to say yes to God and take a step out of the boat when he calls you. You say, you know, a lot of people are doing church but I look for people who have dirty hands and dirty feet. You say, what? He says, what I mean by that are people who are preaching the gospel in the marketplace and ministering to the needs of people. So it is a real pleasure and privilege uh, to welcome you to this little podcast, Rich. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Oh, well, thanks again. Good to so, be here. So Rich, you know, with what's going on, I mean, you've had like 146 approximately trips to the Ukraine in the last uh, how many years since you started your ministry. That's amazing the number of trips you've taken there. What do you do when you go there? Well, in the early years, we trained people. Uh -huh. uh, and actually, that's I should probably explain that because tr what training meant is that we believe that the Bible had both the message in and the methods. And so we facilitated guys getting into the scripture and developing their own strategy for their own ministry based upon the scripture. Mm -hmm. And so I was a guide. I wasn't, I, uh, I had, as you said earlier, I had no theological training, had never started a church. Most people said, you cannot do what you're going to do. And I said, <laughs> well, let's see what God's going to do. And uh, we would gather people, guys around and we'd have a conversation about planning churches and then we'd send them out to put in practice the things we talked about and, and God worked through that all. And so we, uh, we just basically, uh, you know, I think that was the, the job of then and, and even today is a job of exhortation and encouragement. Mm -hmm. We look for guys who have already been called by Christ, who are doing things which are producing re results with baptisms and people coming to Christ and helping people with mercy. And we just come alongside them and encourage them. Uh, so, no, you didn't, you didn't speak the language. So nope. you always had to have interpreters, I'm assuming, yes. right? Yes. yes. How did you get the interpreters? How did that happen? Uh, just connecting with people. I've only had two over the years. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we have the, my current, uh, we need to pray for my current friend and interpreter, uh, Maxim, uh, Maxim Rakovich. Mm -hmm. He uh, took his family two days ago and headed out of Kiev to the west part. And so I talked to him this morning. He has a trouble with his vehicle. Uh, it's leaking oil, but he's mm. taking his family and a couple other families to the western part of Ukraine. So he needs our prayers. 
Wow. Uh, it's been a dear, dear brother for many, many years. Wow. So you've taken, you know, over 140 trips there. You would take multiple trips per year for the most part, I, I assume. Yeah, and in the beginning, we would spend uh, four trips. We would spend six months a year there. In these days, because we have we have a network of guys who are out there doing stuff, uh -huh. uh, I make two trips a year, spending uh, anywhere from three to three, two to three weeks each trip. Wow. And, uh, and basically, I'm just... Uh, always looking for new partners to expand the ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, but the truth is, uh, the finding people as with dirty hands and dirty feet is not that easy. Yeah. Uh, as I said before, a lot of people do in church, uh, but people, it's rare to find people in the marketplace, uh, touching people's lives where they live, meeting their needs. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why, you know, it was so, e it was so easy to find a few people who are able to do this refugee work at this time. Wow. So, I mean, of these 14,000 baptisms that took place there, did they, were, were they, for the most part, were they already in some re, a different religion and then they were converted to Christianity or were they non-religious or just a combination of all of the above? Well, the vast majority of people uh, in Russia and Ukraine are Orthodox in faith. Okay. Which, which means that they were baptized when they were a baby, and they may have gone to church once or twice a year. Okay. Uh, if, you would, if you would ask them, are you a Christian, they would all say yes. Uh, and so they all, they all come, the vast majority all come out of the Orthodox tradition. Okay. But when they say they're Christian, have they really asked Christ to forgive their sins? No. And to be, for the most part, not. It's just no, formal. No, it's just a religion no, rather than a relationship, no. right? No, the evangelical, the, the, the churches of the born again Christians probably are somewhere between two and 3% of the population. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, even Putin is supposedly Orthodox, I'm, I'm led to believe. Is that true? Yes. Uh, he claims to be, have a strong Christian foundation, a strong Christian mother. Of course, George Bush looked into his eyes and saw a good man, and uh, you know. So, but no, he is, he is, he is far away from Christ. Yeah. So when you see what's going on with Russia invading there, and the you know the missiles and the bombs and the shooting and the killing, that must really, really be grievous to your heart, I would imagine, because you know these people, you've been there. What? What? How do you? What's your reaction to all this? I think the, um, you know, I think, you know, time will tell what our reaction is, but my, my initial reaction is obviously one of sadness for the loss of life. Yes. But the truth is, is in the last 30 years, uh, uh, when we came into Kiev as a, as a physical city, it was, it was a, it was a garbage dump. Uh, everything was falling apart. Nothing worked. Uh, people would walk the streets in dark clothing. No one would smile. There was no color. Uh, and uh, they were, it was just, it was a dark place. Really? And over the last 30 years, uh, particularly cities like Kiev have blossomed with new buildings in color. The church has grown. Uh, it, it's come to light. Hmm. And to see it go back, uh, you know, being destroyed by bombs is, you know, it's, you, you, sit, you sit there and you say, Boy, you know, it didn't take long to destroy a lot of things that were built over 30 years, mm -hmm. including people who, who've built homes and families mm -hmm. and to see all that disrupted. Uh, I've talked to several of my partners this week and I hear the shock and mm -hmm. the sadness in their voices. They've been uprooted from their homes. They've been uprooted from their family mm -hmm. and they're, they're vagabonds now. Uh, most of them heading to the west part of Ukraine, which isn't safe itself. I mean, there's no place in Ukraine which is safe sure. today. Mm. So as far as, you know, the last 20, 30 years, the, the, the improvement, you know, the cleaning up and, and expansion and growth, in your mind, is it, is it related in any way to the growth of, of, of God in the lives of people there? Or is it just... The, the fact yeah, that, that they're, they're away from the communistic, socialistic yeah. perspectives of Russia. Yeah, there's a, um, Western Ukraine is the most evangelical part of Ukraine. Okay. And, and, and they are far ahead also in, 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 in quality of life. Okay. Uh, 
as the further east you go, the less uh, per, lower percentage of Christians that you find, and also the lower the lower the the mm -hmm. quality of life. Okay. So there's a definite influence of Christ upon the culture, and you can see it. I mean, you can just physically see it. Okay. Uh, oh, there's a vast difference between West Ukraine and East Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know, this podcast is going to be seen particularly by Christians in America. Um, what, what can, you know, we feel kind of our hands are tied. What can we do, if anything, as Christians at this point? What's the most significant thing we can be doing to be of any help to our brothers and sisters there in Ukraine? Yeah, I said, I, I, I said today in a, I've been sending out daily updates, and I said today, I quoted from St. Augustine, who said, we need to pray like it all depends upon God. And we need to work like it all depends upon us. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage Christians not only to pray, but to give to relief efforts, mm -hmm. uh, because there's there's needs that need to be met. And one of the reasons over the last several years we've gone to mercy ministries is we've recognized that you have to you have to be able to meet a person's physical, emotional, spirit as well as their spiritual needs. So it's you know that's uh, so I would say pray and give. Mm -hmm. And as far as where to give, just to give, give some, maybe a suggestion or two. Yeah. Well, of course I would suggest church planters training international. That's, that's your ministry. That's yeah. our ministry. And, you know, we, uh, we, and people have been generous. Uh, we, uh, the same thing happened in 2014 when mm -hmm. Russia took over Crimea in the East. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we, we put a call out to the people and so uh, our, our, our donors have been very generous. And uh, I think, you know, already, I think probably $50,000 has come in. Praise but God. that's just, that's a drop in the bucket. Yeah, for sure. For that's sure. But drop. still, so the, that's, needs, that's are, the, the needs are going to be, right now, we don't know what the needs are. We, we, because it's like, I've been trying to think of an illustration, but it's like the war has caused, like if you ha had a handful of BBs and you threw them up in the air. Mm-hmm no one knows where they're going to land i mean most of most of people are, are 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 in process of moving uh and so that is that is you know it's it's, it's a the shock of war is there today the confusion is there mm -hmm. uh, people are people are, are in shock mm -hmm. uh and uh, they're confused mm -hmm. uh, yeah the uh you know, our, the American government, you know, we're saying some things and we're trying to put some limits on Russia and so on. How satisfied are you with what the American government, how we've, it has responded to, to uh, the issues there in Ukraine? Well, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I, have, I have been warned by some of my friends to keep the politics out of it. Okay, uh, oh, and that's so fair. I have, that's I have fair. tried to do that. Uh, I would, I would simply say that there's no doubt that the decisions that politics or p politicians make does influence a culture, uh, and uh, and you know because uh, I think you know you and I know would agree that we have turned our back upon God as a nation. Yes. And so this is, this is just a consequence of that. Mm -hmm. Our, our non-response, uh, our accepting our moral responsibility to help a friend shows yes. <laughs> our, the level of our moral, uh, lack of morals, I would say. Yeah. And it's a, yeah. you know, it's a, it, yeah. it's difficult to watch. Uh, mm -hmm. In 2014, when we had an opera, well, let me go back a little bit further. Yes. Most people don't know about the Budapest Memorandum. That was signed in 1994 between Russia, Britain, and the United States and Ukraine. Ukraine gave up their nuclear, nuclear weapons uh -huh. in exchange for border security and national sovereignty. Right. When, when, when Russia invaded in 2014, our government did nothing basically to help them out uh -huh. uh, we sent them uh, 
uh, basically blankets and, and, and food. Oh. And, and, and the president of Ukraine at that time says, it's tough to win a war with blankets and food. Yeah. And so we, we have been, we, we, we have shirked our moral responsibility. Mm. We broke the agreement and uh, you know, it's, it's sad to watch. It's yeah. very sad to watch. Yeah. Well, let me tell you, I mean, I'm amazed at, for example, is it's president Zelensky and, and, and the people of Ukraine and Kiev and so on. I mean, they're, they're not running. I mean, some are leaving and, you know, for the sake of, of protection for their children and so on, but you know, they're, there's, they're fighting in the streets is what I'm led yes. to believe and, and showing courage. And, and I'm wondering if the same thing was happening in Chicago or even Grand Rapids or whatever, whether we would have that kind of courage to stand, you know, the moral courage to do what's right. Do, do you see a difference in the, t- the typical Ukrainian Christian, for example, and the typical American Christian, as far as their courage and, and their being all in, being willing necessarily, if need be, to to give up their life for the sake of, of what they're doing. Do, do you see uh, a difference? Yeah, there is a difference, but I think the, the, the honesty of it is, is that Ukraine has been conditioned to be prepared for this time because from 1917 on, they've been a nation of suffering. Uh, in, in, two, in, in 1932, uh, the Russian government uh, starved to death somewhere between nine and 12 million Ukrainians. Uh, they lost multiple people in World War II. Uh, they, they lost multiple people under the reign of Stalin. So they've been a suffering people. Wow. And they've, they're finally saying, you know, enough is enough. Hmm. We are Ukrainians and we're not gonna put up with it anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so they've been conditioned by suffering to come to this point. Uh, and that is, you know, it's tough to compare nations. Yeah. Uh, we're pretty soft. Yeah, we haven't. Yes, we have we not. Are. We have not had uh, the suffering. Uh, you know, if 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 our internet goes out, we think we're suffering. Yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah, so there's a whole different. <laughs> it is not the same. Mm, yeah, you know, I, I saw this. Or someone shared actually this data. Uh, he said that in the five nations where the, the church in those nations is being persecuted the most is where the Christian church is growing the fastest. Yeah. yeah. And the five nations, on, in contrast, the five nations that have relative peace and freedom for the church is where the church is either stagnant or in decline, which includes the United States. Has it been growing in the Ukraine from what you've seen, for example, with what they've had? Yeah, the, my observation of the growth of the church in Ukraine is that like in 1989, 1990, when freedom came, there was rapid, rapid growth. Hmm. Um, and since that time, probably that happened through, through the late 1990s. Okay. But then they got comfortable too. Okay. Uh, prosperity yeah. came. Uh, the church buildings were rebuilt. Guys got theological education, and so in the last, I would say, the last eight to ten years, Christianity, the growth of Christianity, has slowed significantly. Uh, isn't that isn't that isn't there something sad about that? That when we have freedom, we just get kind of lazy, and yeah, we deserve this, and well, I'm. I'm an American Christian, so I deserve my peace and quiet and comfort and internet, yeah. as you point yeah. out. And um, and we don't share the gospel. We don't we don't we don't see the urgency. Do we really need to live with persecution for for us to flourish? Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, it almost seems like we do. What do you think? Well, the whole the whole. I mean, it's our nature to want comfort. I'll tell yeah. you a story about a friend of mine. Uh, Vlad Maholsky. Vlad Maholsky uh, went to the east part of Ukraine in 2014. He was captured by the rebels, spent 10 days being uh, being tortured, and uh, he, they sold his, his van. He was doing humanitarian work. He, he has gone there every week since that time. 
uh, a real patriot, a real strong Christian, plus starting churches and drug rehab programs. But the story I wanted to say is I had lunch with him and his pastor. And his pastor got me aside and said, Rich, would you please tell Vlad to stay closer to the church? Because I really need him here. And, you know, and there's there's a story of, you know, what what we're so we want our Christianity to live within the four walls. Yeah, and, right. And, yeah. Just hunker down. And, and yeah. yeah. And, and people what, like Vlad are, you know, thank God that God has given us people like Vlad. That's right. And, you know, I mean, the, the Great Commission, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and earth be given yep. unto me. Yep. Therefore, because that's true, yep. don't play defense. Don't huddle yep. in your little church building. Yep. Go, you 11 yep. guys, make disciples, baptize yep. them, and uh, teach them to obey. And those 11, I think 10 out of the 11 ended up dying prematurely. Yes. They didn't die of old age. No. Nope. And Apostle John, they tried to kill him by throwing him in a pot of oil, hot oil, but it didn't work. So he may be the only one of those 11 that died of old age. But because they were faithful, you and I are talking here today about Jesus. That's and right. And he still has all authority. Yeah, the, we're, uh, we're studying, ahead. we're in a little Bible study down here. Uh, yeah. And we're into Matthew, uh, Matthew 10, verses 38 and 39. Okay. Where Jesus says, take up your cross. Now, I've, had, I've heard dozens of sermons on taking up your cross. Mm. And most American preachers mm. spiritualize that. Uh, and I've had no, I've heard no one to say that that actually means be willing to die. There you go. For Christ. There you go. But you don't hear that. That's you know, right. You want to, you want to yep. interpret that so many different yep. ways. Yep. You may give up a diet or give up a Coke or give up, you know, yep. doing this or that, but it actually means be willing to die. Yep. And I think every partner that we have is willing to die for their faith. Yep. All right. I want you to speak right now, Rich, to Mr. Average Christian, um, American Christian, um, as to what you would love to, based on what you know from Ukraine, what you know from scripture, what you've seen, what you've seen in history, what would you like to tell, if you could speak to every American Christian today about what what would what God would like them to know and to do? What would you tell them? Yeah, I, I just repeat what I said earlier. It's um, it is one is to pray because that truly is where the power is. Pray, but also we're called to to do. We're called to we're told we're called to be the hands and the feet and the voice of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so uh, I don't know if I can, if you want me to give you my email address where yeah. people can, can contact me to learn how to give, but it's, it's rich cpti at gmail.com. Repeat that, repeat it. Rich, R-I-C-H, cpti at gmail.com. Okay. And, and what we're doing is uh, we have sent, so far we've sent three batches of funds over to Ukraine. We've selected four men, mm -hmm. four men who have a history of being in the trenches, meeting the needs of people. I talked to one, one of the guys today. He, what he's doing is their, their group is, is baking bread and they're taking the bread to the soldiers on the front line. Because the truth is that the Ukrainian army, as much as, much as proved as it is, doesn't do a good job of taking care of its soldiers. Uh, the, uh, the other, another partner of ours has been preparing housing for refugees, which are on, on their way. Mm -hmm. He's been buying mattresses and food and things like that. So those are the, those are the, the mercy missions uh, that our guys are involved in. Mm -hmm. And uh, they mm -hmm. are they are they're men of mercy the mm -hmm. men who love christ and and nothing will stand in their way hmm. um, well let me just quickly as we bring the plane in for landing here is there any justification for what putin is doing with the russian army in, in invading um ukraine i mean is there any is he reacting to some terrible thing that ukraine has done or anything else or is it just 
the fact that he wants this thing, uh, greed, basically, and, and power. Is there any it is greed, it is greed and power in the in in his mind and there is a it's not really a, a contrast between Russians and Ukrainians. There's something called the Soviet man. The Soviet man was born out of communism, and he believes that you know you haven't heard this for a long time. Yeah, but a, a Soviet man believes that communism should rule the world. Okay. And, and that is the Soviet man. And when you talk to the Soviet man and you look in his eyes, you see he's empty. Uh, he is an atheist. He, he actually hates God. And that is the Soviet man. And Putin is a Soviet man who has a hard heart. And so he is doing what comes natural to him okay. as expanding communism. And they believe that they have a, a divine responsibility <laughs> to own what they have owned in the past. Wow. Well, you know, I had the thought, somehow it just occurred to me, is when uh, Jerusalem was surrounded by the Assyrians during the reign of King Hezekiah. And I mean, they were just, I mean, there's no way that they militarily could defeat this incredible army of 185,000 soldiers surrounding Jerusalem. But they prayed. And then Isaiah yep. had a prophecy that just said, it's going to be okay. Yep. In the middle of the night, God descended on that army of the Assyrians and killed all the soldiers, 185,000 soldiers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I don't know, I just had that thought in the last few days. And I thought, you know, what would it take for, for God to, to protect the Ukrainian people? especially the followers of Christ there, sure. but the people themselves, I mean, they're, they're, they did nothing wrong to deserve what's happening. And uh, so I don't, I, you know, I've actually prayed, God, show yourself strong, whatever it takes, sure. humiliate Putin, whatever it takes. Yes. And maybe people can, can join in that prayer. So yes. anyhow, well, what, well, you know, Ukraine did that in 2014. <laughs> it's called the Maidan revolution. Hmm. It was where they threw off the yoke of the Russian back leader wow. and they and the, the 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 soldiers for the government had weapons and tear gas and all the Ukrainians had were wooden shields. That's all they had wooden shields and sticks. And they stood there and they actually defeated this vast array of forces against isn't them. that amazing and so we we saw that and it was it was wonderful to see the not only the people of god all the people who, who who desire freedom they came together and they threw out that russian dictator isn't that uh, amazing and, that's amazing you know, yeah and very similar to the story you just you just you oh. know, reiterated well god do it again well close us in prayer would you rich sure. yeah <laughs> father we uh at this time, we do ask that your protecting hand cover Ukraine. Yes. Lord, we pray that for each individual. Mm. We pray that evil will be defeated. Mm. We pray that evil will be exposed. We pray that people's eyes will be open to their need for repentance. They will be able to see that their own sin is part of this problem. Yes. And Lord, so that you will lead a revival of the church in ukraine mm. as you have done in the past lord yes. and yes. so would this just be another chapter chapter of bringing the people of ukraine to you lord we do not understand how you work or we don't really understand any of it so lord open our eyes to see what you're doing and allow us to join the fight to mm. join you mm. in in spreading the love of christ upon this nation yes lord amen amen Thank you, Rich. God bless you. And, and thank, thank you again thank you, for being with us and, and for just persevering. And we will be praying. Thank, thank you. you God bless. Bye-bye.